Thank you, Pre uh, President, Chancellor, academicians, colleagues, particularly Pr Professor Fabio Ferrucci and Professor Farrell. Thank you for all you've done to ensure reasonable accommodation and include me in your work this week. Please make these changes permanent. We saw the Holy Father in a wheelchair this morning, which can only remind us of the need. We need to be at the table to enjoy the great feast that we read about in Luke 14. If you are talking about disability, you have to include disabled people from all parts of the world. Many times you've quoted the phrase rightly, nothing about us without us. And this means including people, removing barriers, providing reasonable accommodation to all. It also means providing a pipeline into the work, for example, of the Pontifical Academy of Science and Social Science. What is that pipeline? Most of us are academic. I would ask you, how many people with disabilities do you supervise in their doctorate? How many master's students in your institution have disabilities? And if not enough, I presume it's not enough, it's not enough for any of us, how much outreach are we doing to welcome new students with disabilities into our universities and colleges? Professor Puxo mentioned research. If we have a majority of people without disabilities talking about disability, we cannot claim to be participative or inclusive. So what is disability? You know it. We heard this morning from the Holy Father, impairment and illness is part of the human condition. It is part of our embodiment. We can improve public health, medical care, rehabilitation, and we should prevent and provide care, but we will always have illness, impairment, aging. Disability is part of God's creation. So we can read in Psalm 139, I am strangely and wonderfully made. To be human is to be disabled. There are no special needs, as has been said. We are all equal. But within the range of capabilities, capacities we see in the human population, some people are disabled or regard themselves as disabled. They are in a category. So who are they? And for a start, we must all accept there is no single definition or categorization of people with disabilities. Different studies and surveys and regulations for our government services will ask many questions about functioning. We'll use the Washington Group short set of six questions or the longer set of Washington Group questions. And they result in different estimates of how many disabled people there are in the world. Can we agree that 15% is about right? That's what we did in 2011 more than one billion people in the world. One in every six or seven people. Every family in the world is affected by disability. And we know that disability is changing. Professor Leonardo, Leonardo talked about aging. 50% of disabled people are over 60. So there's a close connection between aging and disability. But I think it's also very important to differentiate between subjective and objective definitions or approaches to disability. Many people we would say are objectively disabled do not identify as such subjectively. So the DRC, the Disability Rights Commission in the UK did a survey. And they, they were talking about all disabled people. And they found that 50%, 50, one in every two, half, 50% of disabled people did not identify as disabled. And now, disability is changing. There are many more people identifying in adulthood as neurodivergent, as people with autism or dyslexia or, or ADHD. So I read the other day, the majority of disability is hidden. And I thought, this cannot be the case. And then I looked at the numbers. Of course, it is the case. There are many more disabled people than we think. 
Now, there are at least two radical approaches to disability. As Professor Wickenbach said, the minority group approach of Holland Hahn, mainly in North America, and there's also the social model approach of Oliver and others, mainly in the UK. But both of these are worldwide. And they're part of the family of social approaches. And in fact, they mix. Most people who talk about the minority group of disabled people also talk about disabling barriers. And most people who talk about disabling barriers are really minority group people. They are mixed. And both uh, are mixed. And in the UNCRPD, which we heard about this week, I mean, it doesn't define disability. It's too big a problem to solve, even in the CRPD. Mainly minority group approach, elements of social model emphasis on disabling factors, you will read there. But it is a human rights approach. That is its great strength. But human rights, I think, are based on individualism. Um, we should, individuals have the rights under human rights law to particular benefits. They can take claims, make claims. Now, both these radical approaches, minority groups, social model, and also the CRPD, focus on disabling barriers or oppression, not on impairment or illness. But all disabled people are people with impairment, by definition. And I think our approach will explore different levels of disability. The legal, the medical, maybe genetic. I can tell you I have a G2A transposition from the age of my FTFR3 gene. Sorry, Chancellor, sorry. That, I don't know, that is more of the, the uh, uh, Academy of Science, perhaps. But it, that's who I am. But also, we have environment, social, cultural. Now, if we're looking for a medico, psycho, social model of disability, we could say we have the ICF. Everybody is on a continuum of functioning. But the ICF, I'm sorry, is not perfect. Personal factors, they're not explained. They're not explored properly. When we take activity limitation and participation restriction, they're not separate. There's not different terminology for each of them. And I think it's very important that we see the environment, the context in which you live, affects your impairment, the epidemiology of impairment, as we've heard this week. It affects attitudes, cultural assumptions about disability. The environment affects everything. And I want to move away, I want us to move away from individual ways of thinking about disability. As we heard uh, all this week, we need to think relationally. We think differently. So we could talk about the Aristotelian virtue ethics of Martha Nussbaum. We could talk about the feminist ethic of care of Joan Tronto, Eva Fedekide, which has been mentioned this week. We could talk about the African notion of Ubuntu, also mentioned this week. All of these combat individualism. They combat independence. They make clear that human beings, human societies are interdependent. As Ana Marta Gonzalez has said, we need relational autonomy. Many people have said. And I think if we want to build an inclusive society, we need to oppose individualism at all costs. Because individualism divides people from each other. It says you can compete, you can win on your own. And in particular, disabled people often need others as helpers, as assistants, as carers. Independence is a myth, as we've seen, as we know in our lives, our families and today. But as I've said, I think impairment is difficult. Impairment is not great. It limits the choices available to human beings. But life with impairment can be good. That is a paradox. Impairment is bad. Life with impairment can be good. As if disabled people are like the happy slave that Amartya Sen and other people discuss. Surely we should try to stop impairment. We look both ways before we cross the road. But the solution, I think, is this. It's true. People with significant impairments have more limited choices. But if you can have access to your limited choices, 
If you can have assistive technology and adapt it in accessible home, healthcare and income, family life, your life can be good. That is the reason for the disability barrier. That is why we say our lives are good, because they are good. It's not adaptive preferences. It's hedonic realism. We are living good lives. That is the paradox. But most people with disability do not have their choices met. They do not have assistive technology. My wheelchair costs 3,000 sterling pounds. That is not available worldwide. Only 15% of people worldwide who need wheelchairs have the wheelchairs they need. That is why they have low, a low quality of life. Not because they have disability, but because they have disability in an unjust world. So what can we do? We can remove barriers so we have an enabling society. We can provide reasonable accommodation, as I've enjoyed this week. That's social model, human rights, minority group model, empowerment. There are no special needs. Professor Leonardi is quite right. Ordinary needs are not met for everyone. Ordinary needs to transport, to employment, to communication are not met. Maybe if we have reasonable accommodation barrier removal, we'll have inclusion for more people. But we see from Sabina Alkira and Monica Pinello and Cantillo's data on multidimensional poverty that more developed societies are often more unequal societies. We have a disability divide, a huge problem for disabled people, which we have not overcome. And so in our institute, we're working closely with the missing billion, which is about inclusion in healthcare, barrier removal, training of healthcare workers to include more people. So we can do all these things. But I think what we've learned this week is that we must do a third thing. We must change our thinking to a more inclusive notion of disability and embodiment, a less individualistic approach to disability. And you might think I should therefore, if I'm thinking about a, a, a less individualist approach, include charity. Because charity is a more inclusive and enabling possibility. Caritas, as we all know, means love. And the Holy Father talked about charity in this way this morning. But in practice, as we've learned from Baroness Hollins and many others, charity organizations the human expression of charity is often controlling and separating. Baroness Hollins has spoken of orphanages which are supported by many good Catholic people who think they're doing good. But the orphanages and the other enterprises may control and separate. And so I quote Leo Tolstoy himself, a Christian, who said this. He said, I sit on a man's back, choking him and making him carry me, and yet assure myself and others that I'm sorry for him. And we should lighten his load by all means possible. Except by getting off the back. Now, th what Leo Tolstoy said is relevant to a lot of areas of life, I'm afraid. But it reminds us that charity can be a segregating, not in an empowering force. It comes from noble motivation. We want to help the weakest and the poorest as the Holy Father and many others have said and written. We want to accompany people in their mental or physical illness or impairment. But we must do so in ways which promote inclusion, which promote acceptance, which promote solidarity, not in ways which promote separateness. Above all, as Rodrigo Aguero Lopez suggests, we need justice in our world for disabled people. That is what true fraternity demands. Thank you.